The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. How exciting is that to say? I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Fin365 is a fellow financial advisor, so knows our our suffering and experience, mm-hmm. uh, worked as at Microsoft as a lead program manager and has possibly the best title ever in his LinkedIn profile of Director of Relaxation and Fun for a guest house in Torquay. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Stephen Handley. Thank you, Peter. Great to be here. (laughs) I didn't realize you were going to dig up dirt on me, but yes, have lived a few lives, um, including running a guest house for five years with my wife. And it was all about fun and relaxation. It was surprising how many financial services professionals came and stayed at the guest house uh, during that time. So, Well, of course, it's such a beautiful part of the world down there. It was. It still is, yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, now you've made me edit to my list again of a new visit um, just by doing that research. So very keen to pick your brain on all things uh, Fin365. But let's just um, get to know you a little better through your yeah. use of technology, all right? And, you know, I have sort of uh, given you almost a warning on this, so please feel free to take your time. But let's start with what's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Yes, I do, uh, and but it does depend on the time of day. So I have I've only had about twenty nine seconds to think of this, everyone. But time of day, <laughs> uh, at the moment at least, I am inundated with messages all over the place. So the thumbs up to say I have received it, and at some point I will respond, is yep. is definitely one I use. But if it's later at night, and I'm I'm done with the, the work day, and I'm just, just um, browsing through some of the LinkedIn conversations and maybe I've had a, a glass of red wine or three. The the <laughs> face palm often uh, is often one that I wish was on LinkedIn. Um, I actually yes. do it myself, but then there's no way to, to trend, which is probably a good thing. I'd probably get in trouble if it was available on LinkedIn. <laughs> so those two, because some of the comments out there boggle my mind, including <laughs> probably some of mine at times when I read them back. <laughs> <laughs> right. The face palm is yeah. a good one, actually. It's um, my equivalent of that, too, is uh, I was a big NCIS fan and the TV show. And there's a character called Donozo and his boss, you know, frequently during the day when he does something really stupi- stupid, will sort of do this slap up the back of your head, mm-hmm. a bit like an Italian mama mm-hmm. sort of slap. And I need one of those on as an emoji because to me, sometimes I'm like, really? <laughs> Snap out of it, sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm with you. All right. So, in terms of your smartphone, we're all permanently attached to them. We are. Uh, if you had to wipe everything off at all those apps, I'm sure you have, which three would you keep? This is a tricky one. Uh, and to be honest, if I could, I would throw it away. And one day I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that uh, because we are tied mm-hmm. to it. And that's it. Uh, mm. We could do an entire podcast on that conversation. 
<laughs> which ones would I? Well, music. Uh, I have a background in in music engineering. I'm still a closet guitar player and and singer songwriter. Uh, so, and these days it's it's Spotify just because that's easy. Um, so yeah. I would absolutely have the music on there. Um, I'd like to say the to do list uh, so that my wife and I were more efficient at communicating what needs to happen. But she doesn't use the to-do list she has her own little book that i have no access to so that's useless uh am i still doing any sort of business um i'm going to assume that at that point um i'm not doing any business at all so maps have to keep maps because these Mm. days we're also hopeless at finding our way around and men have had that problem historically anyway and probably something that gave me a bit of feedback on restaurants or places to eat or mm-hmm. reviews of having worked in hospitality and worried about how we were rating as a guest house. It was always good to get um, consumer feedback. So let's call it um, whichever one of the apps. Whatever yeah, the one of the one is. Trip yeah, advisor, absolutely. But now there's, there's probably a few others. So one of those. Yeah. I'm with you. In fact, I'm at the point now where – I mean, you know, an everyday restaurant where you're just dropping in is fine. But if I'm going to go yeah. somewhere special and, and spend some money, I won't go unless I can see some reviews and also see a menu. Yes, yeah, spot on. It doesn't have to be necessarily today's menu, but I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I need to know what we're in for here. You know, that's how you pick. So I'm right there with you. All right. So let's dive into Fin365. Um, and let's start a bit yeah. high level. For those that aren't aware, I'm sure most are, but for those that aren't aware, where do you guys fit in the advice tech space? You know, what sort of category are you, are you in and who are you generally lined up against, um, you know, as if somebody's considering the, their alternatives? Yeah, it's um, that's probably the hardest question to answer because uh, we're not – we're more of a, a platform than a, an in- individual app. Mm-hmm. Um, so – Broadly speaking, the problem we're trying to solve, which may help answer the question, is is data management right? Um, and automating the flow of data management through the advice process and the client engagement process, yeah. reduplicate, reducing duplicate data entry, uh, having it flow through a broad range of integrations. Okay. So, so at our core, we're a CRM. Mm-hmm. Um, Microsoft Dynamics is the platform that we built uh, Fin365 on. Yep. It started in my own advice business 11, 12 years ago, and I looked at the systems that were available to me off the shelf and said, I need better data management. Mm-hmm. Our customers, were in regional Victoria. Our customers are the mums and dads. The, you'll uh, appreciate this with the business that mm. you've tried to build, um, or not tried to build, the business <laughs> that you have built. Mm-hmm. Uh, we our average revenue is half yep. the industry average, yep. upfront and ongoing. Yep. And so it wasn't sufficient for me to find my 128 clients per advisor or whatever the average is, yep. charge them 5000 a month or 5000 a year, sorry, yep. and play golf on weekends. I had to be able to see more clients. Mm-hmm. I had to be able to still deliver a great experience to those clients. But to do that, I had to reduce the manual effort. Mm. It had to be more automated <clears throat> operational efficiency. So better customer experience to more clients than the average. Yep. And of course, in our industry, maintain the, the quality assurance, the compliance that is always ever present. That meant when I looked at the flow of information from the very first point of contact with the client to the fact find, to the research, the authorities to proceed, the statements of advice, the application forms, the annual review documents mm. go around in circles every year. And the amount, the breadth of information or data that we have to manage, there is not an industry like it. Yeah. Um, I often hear people say that we're the Uber of financial services or the Airbnb of financial services. And my response is always, how many data points do you think Uber needs to deliver you a car and get you to your destination? (laughs) It is not that many. No. No. Compare that with the number of data points that goes into one of our annual engagement FDS and opt-in documents. Yeah. And the the engineering challenge and the information management challenge that financial planners face is, it's just, there's nothing, there's no comparison. Yeah. So the original problem I was trying to solve was that all this data that I need to capture, I need to store, I need to be able to analyze it, and, and then I need to be able to take action from that data, but in an automated fashion as much as possible. Yep. Now, 
100% automation is a pipe dream, but mm. we've got to continue to build to it. So that was the genesis. Mm. And I looked at the systems available to me that were all built as advice production tools, modeling, yep. SOAs, etc. Yep. And their data capabilities were designed around those functions. They weren't designed mm. as broad platform CRMs like a Salesforce or a Dynamics or even a Zoho. Right. So right. I decided better to start with the foundation layer, the data layer. Figure I outsourced power planning. I really didn't care what modeling tool they they need they used. Uh, mm-hmm. And from there, once I had the data management in place, then I would figure out which functions or apps do I connect to that and and integrate with that, so I can do my modeling and I can generate my documents and I can have a client portal. That was that was the original yep. intent. I actually didn't set out to build a software for for financial advisors. It just evolved (laughs) that way. So at our core, we're a CRM, but the reason that Fin365 came into existence was I got about four or five years into the journey and realized it doesn't matter how good Microsoft Dynamics is and how well I have customized it, so much of the data that sits in here gets updated elsewhere first. The credit credit card balance, Mm -hmm. the property value, the insurance premium, the superannuation holdings, the currency exchange rates, and so if I am going yep. to maximize business efficiency, I need all of that information to flow into my CRM from the outside world. So the second right. step we took in developing what has become Fin365 is we started to connect the CRM out to other financial institutions, other systems, data feeds, okay. open banking, uh, the, I'll call it the financial services ecosystem for the flow of information mm-hmm. into the CRM to automatically keep all of my clients' financial information up to date. Data foundation, connectivity. The third space we play in is then the function that you you derive or you you perform off the back of the data, the modeling, the client portal, the SOA production, the product research. And in that space, as much as we can, we want to be a connector, a someone that integrates with yep. the other tools out there. So online fact finds are a good yep. example. Every man and his dog is building an online fact find, and that's the way mm-hmm. it should be. The When it comes to that part yep. of the your overall technology stack, to use the, the latest buzzword, you should have choice. You shouldn't be <laughs> tied to a single yep. online fact find just because you like FIN365 CRM and FIN365 says use our fact find, sorry, or nothing else. And that right. was one of the other... Yeah. Uh, issues with the original legacy systems that were born out of financial planning. You were stuck with their CRM and their functions. And you could not, if I wanted mm. to move to a different modeling tool, I had a da- data migration headache on my uh, hands. Yep. And that's the most disruptive part of to change yep. your technology is data migration. So in an ideal world, you have a, yep. a consistent, very good quality data management CRM practice management platform that integrates with as many other apps as possible and then you pick and choose your favorites. Yep. Uh, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's a long answer to your first question. Where do we play? <laughs> um, we are a practice <laughs> management platform. Our customers come to us because they want to manage, yep. they want a single source of truth of all their data. They want to manage all of their workflows and their activities in one single place. They want all their business revenue to flow into that same system so they can generate a true cost to serve, profitability per client metric, and then make it easy for them to connect to other applications that so they don't have to do the work to figure out how do I integrate MailChimp in my CRM? That's taken care of for them. Yeah, 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 okay. Let's cover the revenue thing just quickly because it's not something that I've brought up, I don't think, on the podcast before, but the um, <laughs> the data that's historically been provided on payments from providers, whether that's insurance or it's a fee collection or whatever it is, has has historically been horrific, to be quite honest. I'm constantly stunned at how bad some of the data is. Are you, have you seen, a, because you're clearly going to be neck deep in that, given that's part of, of what you're, you're pulling into the system, are you seeing that improve? Like, are you seeing there is an improvement in the data or, a, or is the blessed, you know, product provider rebranding and therefore changing everybody's account? I'm like, is that still causing the sort of disasters as it always has in terms of our data uh, and what we receive on income? I know this is audio only, but there was a big smile on my face when you asked that question. <laughs> the, 
So the short answer is no. Uh, one of the yeah. first apps that we actually built ourselves. So we have built a, a collection of applications that sit outside the CRM. And one, the first one was revenue management, the ability to yep. import all of those different sheets into the CRM, yep. tie them to my client, tie them to the product that they're associated with, the referral partner, et cetera, to give us yep. some really rich business intelligence and then the ability to automate some of that FDS and opt-in. Right. Um, no, there's been no improvement and I don't anticipate there will be. Uh, yeah. The, the data that, data itself is actually not that complex. It's it's the amount of revenue, it's a date, it's which client's attached yep. to, which account or policy has it come from or, or loan if it's mortgage yep. commission. Um, is it upfront or ongoing? It's just that they're all yeah. in different formats and every sheet yeah. comes through in a different way. And um, so the delivery of the data and the the formatting of that data is so varied that you essentially need a system that can help you convert it into a standard form. Yep. So that's we have yep. built that. Um, but those the the systems in the product providers that's that are generating those sheets they are so antiquated and <laughs> and there's so many other problems that the product providers need to solve first they're mm. quite happy to put the the effort onto the advisor to figure out how they take all of that revenue data and turn it into something meaningful uh, so i don't yeah. anticipate any investment in that i've i've not heard of it that, happening yeah. and i i doubt it will for a long time because it is, it's an example of one of those things that, with some alignment, the effort saved could be enormous. You know, I put it in the same category as consent. You know, so if we've, if we could get one agreed consent that advisors get signed by the client, and we can give it to providers, like the raw, like the volume of effort going on right now <laughs> handling that stuff, is is enormous. And I think this is another category. So it is, I, I'm with you. I don't see anything. I don't see any work on that, but it is one of those things that there is so much time and effort put into right now that is a little ludicrous because actually the number of institutions pushing out this data is the list is relatively small now. I mean, compared to what it used to be. So actually, you know, by them getting on top of their end, it could impact um, you know, the the industry in quite a big sense. But I'm with you. I don't I don't expect too much of that to change. Uh, there is one the more piece. There is one more piece on that though that I am seeing, um, in that there's a lot more direct invoicing yep. happening, a lot more fixed monthly fees out of a cash management account happening. Yep. That is also revenue data that has to flow in as well. Um, mixed discipline firms also want to bring in their accounting revenue or their lending revenue. Yeah. Um, so even if all of our insurers got together and said, here's a standard format, you yeah. still got the, the need to bring in other revenues from other sources. Yep. Um, I'm firmly with you on the um, on the annual engagement product provide. They could do more and some have. I'm going to give yeah. – I will give yeah. a shout out because NetWealth – Hub, Challenger, they're the top that I can remember, all yep. except third-party forms, yep. um, all of which we have automated. And so the delivery of those has become, anyone using those, uh, have a much easier time than yep. some of the ones that I won't pick on or mention. Yeah. But, yeah, they could do more in that space, absolutely. They should. And for their own benefit too, to be quite honest. It is one of those things that I'm confident they're spending in an inordinate amount of time internally as well, processing all this stuff. So if it can get a bit streamlined, it would make it easier. There'd be less mistakes and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, agreed. So, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. So then I do have a, a, <clears throat> a question that's, you know, me as a sort of a data freak and having spoken to, you know, enough um, apps both in and outside the industry, Time series data is interesting, right? And so for the listener, they might not be aware at the fact that um, having, you know, a balance sheet effectively or, you know, a, a snapshot of a client situation, absolutely doable. That's fields that have figures in them and you can have a data feed and it feeds in the data, right? Great. But what is harder to do and is not all that common necessarily is, well, I want to look back and be able to see the progress, over time for that thing. Where are you guys placed on that? And do you see that being something that's valuable, important, or is it something that, you know, has has got parked as a as a need or a want for the system? Well, that helps that I sat in the advisor chair. I used to do that in Excel um, mm. because 
coming out of, well, I suppose, the, the, the technology background I did, when I first came into advice and I sat in the advisor chair and had to articulate my value to the clients, yep. it was a forward-looking promise that I was making. Yep. Like I promise I'm, or you trust me, I'm going to deliver value over time. I couldn't, there are certain problems you can solve and give them instant gratification, but much of it is a forward looking promise. Yeah. And so I just started tracking every time I did a review, I would track the, where was the balance last time we saw each other and what's the Mm. balance today. And over a three to five year period, I was able to say, Hey, here's the difference we've made. So actually one of the first things I built in the CRM was a recurring snapshot of account balances and loan balances so I could show yep. growth of assets and decline of debt over time. Yep. Uh, so that's that's a feature that we've had from day one because I wanted it as an advisor. Right. And because in isolation, you know, one thing alone, say that balance could be dropping, but that's because there's withdrawals being made that are building up in a cash balance. I mean, you, you, it's right. So it's yeah, like the, the client um, – and and also the client themselves might see that dropping and go, oh no, and it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> but what about that extra few hundred thousand you've got over there now? You know, yeah. so it's giving them that context. If there's nothing else we provide to clients, one of the most valuable things I think is context. Mm-hmm. You know, really giving them a picture. So look, it's exciting to hear that because I I think you'd agree it's not something that's necessarily all that popular, um, or comes up a lot. But I do think um. It's it's almost giving them those guardrails, isn't it? It's helping them see: Are we still on on track? Are we still within where we'd expect to be? Um, and you know how how might it go in the future? Um, so then, okay. So the primary users then of Fin three six five, you're coming. It does sound like very much like the practice management end. So I'm betting, you know, licensees and 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 practice managers and all that sort of thing are very keen. To the extent though that it sounds like it's right through to advisors, do admin like is it right through the practice generally that you get users? Is it or is it just advice and and you know senior personnel? How do most people use the system? Yeah, it, it generally every user in the business has a license uh, okay. for because of the centralization of activity. Okay, and so appointments that used to just sit in your Outlook calendar and and weren't connected to the client in the CRM unless you added a manual file note. Mm-hmm. In our world, they're in the CRM because of the integration with Outlook. Okay. tasks, emails, phone calls. So anyone doing anything in the business that is in any way client facing uh, or for the client uh, has a has a license. Absolutely. Okay. And so given this is um, you guys have built this in the Microsoft world, um, then it sounds like there's particular benefit for people who are generally operating in that product with suite, right? So they're using, you know, Outlook and others, then clearly that's going to be a more natural um, mesh than say, you know, for us, we operate in G Suite and mm-hmm. in the Google land. So clearly it sounds like for Microsoft people, like there's some real instant blending that can go on um, in terms of, you know, where they look to do's and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Is that is that valid? Yeah. It's the, the integrations, as you would expect, Microsoft and Microsoft, they're going to make <laughs> yeah. it the best of breed. The, it's seamless. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, I looked at Salesforce, I looked at Zoho, I looked at others that were available. Dynamics at the time wasn't the best CRM, but mm. I suppose the fact that I worked at Microsoft helped maybe guess where they might be taking this. Yep. And the integration of their broader suite of technologies, uh, the guess was if they get that right, then the benefits it will deliver to my business will be immense. Yeah. So we are very much standing on the, the shoulder of that giant now. And when you look at use cases or scenarios like click a phone, icon in the CRM, it pulls up Microsoft Teams, it makes the call, it records the call, it converts it to text and provides you analytics about the positive or negative sentiment within the phone conversation. That sort of uh, functionality is not something that Fin365 would ever build. It's not something that Iris will ever build. Yeah. Um, But it is amazing the value it adds back into your business. And so- we're picking that up from Teams and Ship or Power BI and Power Automate. You, know, you just have to pull up the the, the number of Microsoft icons um, yeah. to see what's possible. And do you think then um, that part of what you know a practice would experience by um, you know 
coming on board with Fin365 is sort of accelerating that take up because I do know, I mean, we, I, you know, some months ago did an interview with somebody who, who works a lot in the, in the suite of, you know, Microsoft 365 and, and he, you know, his key message is nobody's using this enough. Like you, you, you know, we're all touching on about 10% of what's available right. and what's, what you're already paying for. That's not even adding you know, more of their things. It's just the ones you're in. So do you think because um, you're being another connector through all of those that it can sort of accelerate the practice take up in all of these other features? Yeah, we, um, yes, because as part of the onboarding journey and the ongoing engagement that we have with all of our customers, the inevitable business questions of how should I store my files in this new world right, versus data or workflow management or I would like to automate the creation of a no change ROA. You know, is that yep. possible? All of those business needs, generally Microsoft suite of tools will play a role in those. Yep. And and so as we progress through through the business improvement cycles, uh, we touch on more and more and more of the technologies um, yep. off the back of and in, in improving quality database underneath um and i'll one example i use and this is not specific to microsoft but it just sort of paints the picture is the birthday email i always use this mm-hmm. one in a, in a, all my demos uh, because that's a nice touch point with the client good yeah. customer experience if you can automate it doesn't cost anything now uh, yep. can be a nice pretty html template so why would why would an advice business not turn that on yep uh, but if historically you've not focused on making sure that your staff enter the date of birth in your database or the email address, <laughs> then that email can never be automated. Yeah. And when we see that time and time again, because historically some of these systems, once the data was in there, it really didn't do much. So right. there wasn't a level of discipline built on top of the technology to say, this is what we want to get out of it. Therefore, here's what we need to put into it. Yeah. So a big part of our journey is, is highlighting gaps in the data that would then prevent you from generating a no change ROA. Right. That could be done through Power Automate, another Microsoft tool. So yeah, there's a lot of that. And the thing about that too, I'd say is, um, and we've learned this the hard way. You know, I, I, like yourself, I'm very focused on the quality of the data and what we collect, um, and and utilizing a CRM to collect more and more of it. You know, so so things that we constantly have in documents that don't ever make it into the CRM. You know, it's that sort of stuff, right? And it's that intelligence, but. Um, the thing that I think most people get a bit overwhelmed is, is they're, they're like, oh, okay, well, the date of births have to be up to date. So, uh, you know, I'm going to have to get a team member to just get our full client list and update them all at once. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> guys. 12 months in a year, <laughs> you could do a 12th of them a month ahead, you know, right? So, so right now, you know, you could get somebody working on the January birth dates and just make sure that they're up to, you know, so there's ways to do this that aren't quite the impost that I think a lot of practices approach these things on. They really just, it's almost tools down. We've got to fix everything right. and off we go. And it's not manageable ongoing. You know, if there was one single big thing we did once in our business, maybe, but this is going to be perpetual. Yeah. We're always going to be doing these tweaks. So, so to sort of, you know, chunk it down, I think means that you can, it just means that it's a bit more organic, you know, and it's going to take a bit bit of time before you're at perfection. But then invariably there's another field that you need to update or, or, that's right. or change, right? And, and, and that's why it's really important, regardless of which system you're using, for the database, the CRM, to be an integral part of your day-to-day activity. Yeah. Because if you're in there looking at a client and you see that the salutation field is empty, Right. It takes you two seconds to put Mr. or Mrs. or Miss or Doctor or whatever you like, which then can flow through to a, a document template and yep. result in a more complete document at the push of a button, Yeah, which will happen time and time again. And it's only one salutation, one date of birth it has to go in, but the long-term benefit you get. So I agree, most of it, you need to get to the point where it is organic. Mm. There are some things though, when we go through a lot of data cleansing in the early stages, um, and just yesterday, I had one of our customers that I sat down with him, CEO, and he looked at the contacts and the dates of birth, and he went, oh, my goodness, they're empty. He said, yep. And in, and so he talked to his staff, and they said, well, actually, the platform we use has all the dates of birth for every client. So yeah. we do a bulk export from the pla- platform, match the names or the account numbers 
bulk update the dates of birth. So generally what we find is some, 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 this, this data is sitting somewhere. You yeah. can't open an account without, you know, AML. Yeah. So if you can get it from somewhere that it somewhere already else. sits that's not a PDF yeah. <laughs> um, and do bulk updates, then that's actually not that um, time-consuming and, and not a monumental project that's all too hard to, you know, yeah. to tackle. Yeah, for sure. Um, to that end, uh, the you know data feeds is something that that can be a a bit of a bugbear um, for advisors, uh, and I'm imagining you've experienced that challenge of the quality of data feeds. Um, and I saw oh, it's just taking a look, you know, on the website. Then you do have integrations directly to a number of providers. Do you find like how are you choosing that? Are you just choosing the ones that you know that you can get quality? That it's not that it's reliable because that's the other challenge, right? If you start to sus, you know, suspect the data in the data feed, we, we stop using it and we start Correct. manually enting stuff, right? So how do you handle that? It's a, uh, the smile there was almost as big as the revenue management smile. <laughs> uh, so we, I made the decision when we spun off the the software, and and it was because of that integration uh, piece that I knew was necessary. I had a choice. I, I could go and look for a third-party provider who had already figured out all the connections and feed from one. That would have been easy, um, but it would have come at a cost. And when I asked advisors who were using other systems that were using third-party providers, I I asked that question, do you trust the data feed? No, never trust them. <laughs> no. All right, well, if you don't trust them, then you're always going to turn back to the platform. And so it's kind of that, well, where under delivering why would we even go down that path you'd be better off saying we don't do data feeds and mm. then you don't disappoint yep so i made the decision to but i knew it was necessary so i made the decision to go direct to yep. each provider um, which meant that if there was a problem it was either us or them and yep. we could more easily figure out the issue i knew they weren't going to be perfect it meant a longer more patient process because getting access to all these data feeds and the yeah. systems vary, the methods of delivery vary, the formats vary. Some institutions are more than happy to connect. Others are like, you know, come and talk to us when you're as big as Iris. Right. And then, so you've got to deal with all that. Yeah. Uh, at this point, we do have pretty good coverage on the wealth side, especially uh, the mm -hmm. insurance companies are still dragging their feet. Um but it, it does vary uh, how would I judge it overall. Most of the time, as long as the, the feed doesn't break, which happens from time to time. Sure. Um, the data is actually pretty accurate. Okay. Where the anomalies lie can be differences in time between, so we're getting our unit prices from a central market source. Yep. And the providers are getting, the platforms are getting their unit prices from a source. If yep. there's a delay, they can be out of balance a bit. So right. depending upon, you know, if the advisor is more of an engineering brain, they're going to pick that up and they're going yep. to care more than if they're perhaps a sales brain and it's close enough. Yep. Um, so you've got to then coach your customers to say, look at the number of units. If that's accurate, then it's just a delay issue. Yep. There are other anomalies, sell downs, where we've sold out a bunch of stock and the dollars are floating in midair and haven't landed in the cash account yet. Yeah. You know, and you've got to wait a couple of days. Yeah. There's stuff like that we can't control. Um, so for the most part, um, the the platforms where we have a back-end feed, um, often the more modern platforms where the, mm. the, the inflows are going in the right direction, right. Um, they're, they're perfectly fine. They work yeah. really well. Um, yeah. But we but we do have the the benefit of if there is a problem we go straight to them figure it out yep. and can fix it pretty quickly. Yeah, and look, I think uh, this is something that I think probably advisors haven't um, felt a need to champion or or start yelling. I guess about is you know data feeds is one of those things we need to be making clear to providers that they've got to lift their game. We've just got yeah. to like this is a bare minimum requirement of what we need out of you as a partner, which they are. You know, these providers are, are our partners. Um, lift, we need you to lift your game. You know, whereas I think there was a lot of, oh, what can we do? You know, like there was a lot of, oh, well. Um, and like you say, oh, well, if you're one of the big guys, it's like, that's not, that's not how it works anymore. There are so different, so many different places, um, that people can be getting their tools from that, um, the one dominant player that you can go, it's just not going to apply anymore. 
Um, so, yeah. you know, they're going to need to get better at that. Um, and more willing to engage on that, on that. And it's important for them too, you know, the quality of the data, there's less calls to the BDM to say, why doesn't this match? There's less, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it's going to make everybody's job easier. Well, it will become hip pocket yeah. stuff. So I was in a meeting with a platform last week at the request of one of our larger customers uh, who to discuss not just data feeds, but straight through processing right. back to the platform for opening new accounts. Yep. Uh, and that, I know I sat in that room because the customer said, sit down and figure this out because we want this. Yep. Um, and that that's just the nature of the markets yes. and leverage. And, and But I do agree the value chain has shifted from what used to be back up at the product end. Mm. It's now the consumer is the one who ultimately decides where they're going to spend their money. Yep. They are going to spend their money on advisors who deliver the best possible customer experience most efficiently. Yeah. The advisors are going to select the product providers who make their ability to deliver those services as efficiently and as affordably as possible. They're going to select those providers because there's no longer the big dealer group saying you can only use right. this, these two platforms. It's just not a thing anymore. <laughs> so I think that's going to actually happen quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. So, um, we've covered a fair bit of the integrations. Is there any? Is there any like recent? I don't know tools that you've you've integrated that are I don't know your product comparison or analysis or any other things that you've folded in that you now integrate with any others on the development path. Yeah, lots. So that's where we're spending most of our time. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that's happened for us over the last, well, let's call it the COVID years, <laughs> because we're not an industry specific CRM. Yep. We're not X-Plan or Zero Practice Manager or Mercury or Winbeat in general insurance. We are Dynamics and all the data structures that all of these services need are pretty much the same. Yeah. The workflows vary, but the data is consistent. We have started to find out, um, that we're picking up a lot of mixed discipline businesses. Yeah, okay. And off the back of that, there's requests for, can you integrate with Zero? Because now I'm direct invoicing my clients right. and I would like that data to flow through. Yeah. Or can you connect to Mercury so that when I do my loan originations, the client data is in sync? Yeah. Uh, so most of our – wherever we can find new data feeds, we integrated with Yodley recently to bring in a lot of that open banking data. Yep. We will do that, but more and more it's the functions. What are you doing once you've got the data? Online fact finds. Uh, we've got probably three or four integrations now and more coming. Yep modeling tools, we've got Voyant, we've got Dash, we've got PrimeSolve, we've got X-Plan, yep. all geared at pick your best of breed but then let the data flow without you having to do a lot of manual entry. Right. Um, so that's, that, yeah, that's our heavy focus is expanding that collection of, of connected apps. And it is a, I mean, merely you, you – Starting Fin 365 and getting to where it, it is now is an example of this, of, of going, all right, this is the need and this is where I'm starting and this is what I'm going to do. It's similar to things like a product rex where it's just like, this is a need. We're just going to deeply solve this problem. Like, this is frustrating and I want to fix it. And in this new world, that is possible. People without necessarily deep coding understanding in, in the old terms can solve these problems, you know. So it's great to have tools like, like Fin 365 that will then go, well, sure. If that's if that solves that problem, let's talk to it. You know that that makes sense. Um, you know, it's it's powerful uh, for a practice. It is, yeah. No, Nick's doing a great job with Product Rex. Right. We're you know, partnering with them. Uh, the one thing that has made that easier is just cloud technology. Yeah. It is. It it actually is still complex coding. It's just now that it's much easier. You don't have to set up your own servers. Right. You don't have to have a, a room full of big machines Worrying running machines. and hosting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, systems like Microsoft Azure, which is another benefit of being in the Microsoft world, has made it so easy for us to spin up and deploy anywhere. Yeah. We have customers in New Zealand, South Africa, USA, yeah. and we're a 20-person business in Australia. Yeah. Um, so, the, the cloud has very much accelerated innovation and made it possible to do it affordably. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's the key, right? It's it's making yeah. it accessible without needing to go and get funding for thirty million and <laughs> That sort of thing. It's like crazy 88 bonkers. Let's talk client engagement because the if ever there was a new black for advice in 2023, I'm picking its client portals, right? It's it's the client accessing um, or interacting with the with the advice practice. So I know you guys have a web web portal. So talk me through. Mm-hmm. Clearly, that's probably going to start with a data a data sort of lean, perhaps. So talk us through what the um the web portal does and how you know advisors can use that with their clients. That's another example of a function where we did build it because at the time there weren't other portals we could integrate with. Mm -hmm. Um, And it came out of the need of exposing the data that we have uh, um, for our clients, all that fact find data, Mm. in a way that's meaningful and digestible for the clients. Uh, You touched on the historical balances and the, the growth of wealth over time so a chart that says hey when you first came to us here's where you were now you're up here yeah that that richness of experience that you used to have to do in in a document or maybe you did a powerpoint or maybe you did a bunch of excel spreadsheets to show all of that if you're pulling that information from a database you can expose it in a very rich interface or in the web yeah so we, we did build our own we have an online fact find with the client portal um it's but we also integrate with the shoot wheel. We also integrate okay. with many others. Um, I agree with you, client facing um, the client experience is high priority. We're seeing um, we're seeing Santi and those guys. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Lumiant and, and all Lumiant, those tools. You know, yep. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry, Lumiant. There's all of those ones coming along that are all about a rich client experience. Yeah. Again, they need to draw that data from somewhere. Yeah. Um, and so you'll see those those client-facing platforms wanting to integrate with systems like us, and we will do it. So pick and choose your best. Um, The one thing that's quite new, which I've probably had, I don't know, six in the last month have reached out and said, because I always ask, what what business problems are you trying to solve? Right. The biggest new one is client portal so I don't have to email documents. (laughs) So not so much the rich um, hole of wealth view, it's, I need a secure way to provide yeah. documents because of all these breaches. So yeah. cybersecurity has caused advisors to say need client portal, which yeah. that's that's a new one. Yeah. Um, now you can do that with things like SharePoint and Shared. So there yeah. are ways to share documents securely without the need for a client portal. But if you've got a client portal and you're putting the documents there, and we did do this in our own business. You encourage them to go in. Not mm. only are they retrieving the document, but now they're seeing their world in a way that only the advisor can show them. Yeah. Accountants don't need all of your financial information. Mortgage brokers don't. Yeah. Your financial advisor is the only one that can give that whole of whole of wealth view to the client. Yeah. And I think it is something that, because um, we're all, you're absolutely right, we're all focused on this sort of cyber issue, um, but it probably we haven't really fully understood the fact that, you know, email is sort of like, um, it's sort of like operating in a food court. Like you might be chatting about something to the person next to you, but really almost anybody can just wander past and accidentally hear something. Like it's because they all have entry. As long as they've got your email address, there's sort of this ability to get into your world, right? All your client's yeah. world. Um, whereas a portal at least is sort of more like the private members lounge, you know, like, like you're actually controlling that a bit better. And I think, we probably haven't fully understand or really grasped that before, you know, and so sort of narrowing that down and and making it a more exclusive in the sense of just you and the client experience um, is going to be necessary. I just think it's probably the way we're all going to have to go, you know, so I, I agree. The other analogy would be the cone of silence. Right? Yes. And now, now I'm showing my age, but I do agree that that creating more of a one-on-one engagement, also just the the – efficiency gains of reducing the clutter in your inbox yes it's uh, cutting no, through I, yeah yeah there's the tools and this is not just with the clients this is also internal so back to the question around do you get you know microsoft technologies and better use of that uh when covid hit we, i started getting calls just to ask questions about microsoft teams yeah uh, because now people weren't in the office. They couldn't look over the shoulder of the person next to them and they needed to be able to engage in a richer way. Um, and Microsoft Teams is a great tool for that. Yeah. Uh, when we 
switched on teams in our business years ago now, um, the very first thing rule that was put in place uh, was no more internal email. Yeah. There is no need for any internal email same. anymore. Yeah. And that was a major efficiency boost for the business. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cutting down the number of client emails back and forth uh, yeah. is a major efficiency boost. Yeah. Yeah. And the the thing with email is this dreaded embedding reply rubbish, right? And we think that's a good thing, but it it there's a terrible loss of insight and information in that. You know, it's it's just horrible. Um, let alone the CC function. The, the if I could go back in time <laughs> and stop a feature, it would be CC and BCC on email. It's evil, right? It just clutters up everybody's inbox. Um, so so yeah, I'm right with you there. But so. Let's talk about um, things that you that sort of are sitting within the system. For, you know, current users, um, what are they not using enough? Like, what's the the what are the gems that you're like? Oh, I feel like they really need to check that out a bit deeper because it's got real value. Uh, there's so much functionality in Microsoft Dynamics that there's a lot there that people may never need to use. It's it's mm-hmm. kind of one of those toolkits that it sometimes can be overwhelming in the yep. in the beginning. The one thing that's pretty consistent and takes time and a bit of coaching on our part and a lot of business intelligence feedback is how closely are they looking at their data? Yeah. Uh, I'll give an anecdotal example. I had one principal that was chatting to me about we were looking at business intelligence and he said, I just want to, I need to be able to measure how long this particular staff member is taking on average for each lodgement that they do. Right. A very specific task in the business. And I said, no problem, let's jump in and have a look at the tasks for this particular staff member. And the, one of the reports we have is how what percentage of each team member's time is actually being tracked in the system. Yep. This staff member is about 20%. And I said, well, you're not going to get average time of lodgements because the lodgement tasks aren't even being put in the CRM. <laughs> yeah. So there's your first problem to solve. Yeah. Um, that only came about because we were uh, – having an, a conversation with the customer and guiding them on better ways to analyze their data. Right. It's actually, this may surprise you because I know how d- focused you are on the data in your business. <laughs> There's a lot of principles that are used, their primary role has historically been sitting in front of the client, engaging the client, um, yeah. that customer relations. Yep. Operational focus on on data is not right. something that comes naturally to many people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we can pick that up very quickly by saying, "Show me your current business reports that you generate." You know, yeah. albeit manually to date. And if they don't have any, you kind of get a sense of doesn't matter how rich the business intelligence we give them, they're going to have to change their behaviour. Yeah. So a big one is how how often are you stepping out of the business, looking at your data and figuring out where there are gaps that are preventing you from meaningful change off the back of that data. Yeah. The second one would be to your customer engagement piece, things like uh, bulk emails, so segmentation of emails, um, which a lot of businesses will use a tool like MailChimp for, um, Mm -hmm. for example. Uh, But that creates duplication of effort because you've got to keep manually updating the client lists in MailChimp and those sorts of things. Yeah. Uh, there are fun- There's functionality like that in, in a CRM like Microsoft Dynamics that's native and you can just go in and say, right. oh, like all of my A clients that live in the 32XX area code that like or postcode that like golf because we're right. about to have a golf day and I need to send them, in, them an invitation. Some of that sort of richer customer engagement and, and uh, communications functionality uh, takes a little bit longer for people to start to utilize because they're not used to having it in their CRMs historically. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like, um, and it's it, when I do coaching or sessions, you know, in groups, um, people often focus on the tech first, and it's shiny and it's new and woohoo. Whereas it sounds like what what you've discovered is my experience too, which is you know find the problem first. Where it, where's the big problem? And then we work out how we solve it and what thing you should either incorporate or adjust or change um, because the problem 
A, I, I find often isn't what people think it is. Um, and operation, like you say, operationally, you could have something sitting, say, in the ad- admin team you've never realized they are manually doing over and over and over again. Um, and so instead of hiring a new person, you could just fix that problem. You know, like Absolutely. that there's, sort of thing I see a lot of. Well, there's the famous quote, if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. You want yeah. to lose weight, hop on the scales. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's lots of, and I'm sure our customers use those cl- quotes with their clients because the very yes. first thing that they do with the clients is not focus on is hub better than premium, better than net wealth, better than panorama. They say, what yeah. are your goals? What are you trying yeah. to achieve? From there, they go to strategy. And at the very end, they look at the product. Uh, yeah. And my, my guidance to everyone that comes to talk to us is forget about dynamics versus Salesforce or Fin365 versus this system. What problems are you trying to solve first? Mm. Then we'll figure out what your tech strategy should look like. Then I'll tell you how Fin365 fits into that strategy. And ultimately, yeah. then you can decide whether we're the best tool for that particular part of your overall machine. Yeah. And because one of the gems that happens when you approach it that way um, and you've identified that whatever that big challenge or problem is, when you solve it, you don't have quite the change management task or challenge that you might otherwise because when the team see that it directly relates to that really frustrating thing, they're more likely to go on the journey with you, you know, rather than it being, oh, God, there's another, there's just another app. Why would you need to use another app? You know, whereas if they can directly connect it to something that's frustrating or difficult and their life gets easier, you know, they're in. Um, True. So, Although yeah. with a CRM, it is just like advice. It is a bit of a future promise. Yeah. Because many of those problems get solved once you've got the quality of the data in the system to solve them. Right. And yeah. that's not instantaneous, unfortunately. So yeah. our onboarding, uh, well, I like to say that within six weeks we'll have you at business as usual, but getting you to the point where you're really starting to hum and seeing some significant benefits, Yep, it's 12 months plus. Um, yeah. And that's just yep. the reality of, of the... Uh, the nature of the platform that we, our customers right. are getting from us. And I'm betting that then, you know, when somebody on boards and there's, okay, we get our data to a certain point, you know, down the track, there's going to be another upgrade to that because there's other things we can collect. There's other things that we, you know, should be, should be keeping up to date. So it's, this is a perpetual journey. You know, this is something that we're just going to constantly, and it's an asset, you know, this quality data is, is a wonderful asset in your practice. Yeah, well, well, July 1 last year was like that. Was it last year? When we had the annual engagement obligations changed this year, <coughs> oh the, well, they changed twenty twenty one. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Uh, Due date by this year. Yep. Yeah, it used to be a task, and you generate an FDS doc with an opt-in and signature, and that was it. Whereas yeah. now it's it's which assets are we taking dollars from, and who are the signatories, and the start date, and the end date, the cancellation date, the next start date, the next stop date. Yep. So we had to re-engineer a big uh, an entire process within Fin three six five to allow our customers t- to collect all the data into a single record that could then flow through to the automated documents at the end. Yeah. A regulatory change that was wisely <laughs> – no, <laughs> sorry, couldn't help myself um, – that was you know forced upon us that we had yeah. to adapt to and yeah. that will be. That will be a never-ending journey. Yeah, absolutely. So then I'm betting there's some things that are coming up for the system. There's, you know, development stuff. So I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in the your sort of almost wish list or things a bit further down the track that you'd love to get to, you know, that you'd look, oh, you know, I'm hoping one day we'll get to this point. So what's on the what's on the cards for the future? The uh, There's two two parts to that line. So the first part, the – We've got a lot of integrations now. We'll always add more integrations anytime. Uh, I got um, Inherit Australia, I think. I haven't got mm-hmm. in front of me, but a um, estate planning business. Yep. One of our customers is using uh, and loves it. They're a tech platform. We got introduced to them. We're working on an integration with them. Fabulous. Anytime there's a customer that says, have you seen this, this system and there's a benefit for sharing data, uh, we will put it on the list and then it comes down to, customer demand, our resources, uh, can we integrate? Is there technical um, capability of integration? So we'll always have our eye on that, and that's largely customer-driven. Then as the system grows and as any system gets bigger and the number of customers get larger, there's periods where you have to just pause, stabilize, 
improve performance. Data feeds yeah. is a perfect example of this. The more customers and the more platforms, the the more efficient your data connections have to be. And sometimes you yeah. don't face, uh, you don't stress the system until you get to the customer that instead of 5,000 right. accounts got 50,000 accounts. And like, like, oh, oh hang on, yeah. that just took us 24 hours <laughs> to pull the data feed. Yeah. That's not good. Yeah. Um, so yeah. there's, we, we will continue to take, have moments where we go through that. Uh, yep. In line with that, there's also integrations where the partner enhances. So XPlay is a good example of this. Open Iris, yep. Iris Open uh, version one of that API. There were certain things we just couldn't do in XPlay because yep. of it was version one. Now they have yep. version two, and we're looking at the enhancements we can make, which will further improve the efficiency gains to our existing customers nice. that are using both nice. systems. So that's yep. all of the what's in the near term. The, the holy mm. grail for me, there's two. Um, the first one is solving the cost of implementation. If, you, yeah. if anyone has ever measured the total time spent and the, and the duration of each of the stages of advice, intro, prep the docs, review them, and implement, you will know that the implementation stage is the most costly. So yeah. it doesn't matter if you can produce an SOA in 20 minutes. The implementation mm-hmm. stage is still the most costly part of the process. Yeah. That gets fixed when we have straight through processing with the platforms. Yeah. And I touched on conversations we're having. We've got that in our on our roadmap for 2023. Uh, mm-hmm. We're still figuring out who the, the partners are going to be, who's willing, who's capable of doing it. Uh, but to me, solving that problem means that all of a sudden, Ugh. once we solve that, an advisor can be just efficient as robo advice in quotes. Um, right. I say that facetiously, robo advice. Yeah. Um, so that's a big. That's one we want to solve, and we're that will sort of, for us, that's that's an if you build it, they will come sort of strategy decision. Yeah. Um, because I, I suspect if you ask most advisors if they think that's possible, they'd say no, that's a pipe dream. But it's absolutely possible, and, and that's what we're working on. Well, and and the key the key to that too. Sorry, the key to that too is is. You know, you're working hard on the data feeds one way. This is just sort of the other way. Like the pipeline exists essentially, Correct. right? So it's how can we just go backwards <laughs> up the back yeah. up the pipeline? Um, yeah, and the, and the platforms have to enhance their their interfaces to enable it. Yep. Um, but the the progressive ones that want to see inflows um, know that that's something that if if I can push a button and instead of it taking three weeks to roll from Aussie Super to Harvard, it takes me three days. Yeah then guess where I'm going to be making all my recommendations because yeah. that's a much better customer experience. Yeah. So that's coming. Um, the other big one in light of the drop in advisor numbers mm. and the blue ocean of orphaned clients that mm. can't get access to affordable advice is taking a lot of the technology that we're building to enable and equip advisors to be more effective and efficient and exposing it directly to unadvised consumers. Yep. Give them the ability to come in, do do it yourself uh, until such time as you are, but not not the disconnected robo experience where you do it, and but then as soon as you want to see advisor, they're asking you your first name and if you're married. <laughs> right. Um, having a seamless transition from the do-it-yourself experience to full service experience yeah and even if you want to hop in and out from time to time uh that and people are calling it the hybrid model that's probably the best um, definition of it yep that the the technology that we've we've built with fin365 and all of the integrations we have facilitates that sort of um model yeah um and i saw this 20 years ago at fidelity in the us when i worked at microsoft I they managed our 401ks, which is the version of superannuation. I could do things on the Fidelity website. Yep. I could buy stocks. I could switch my managed funds. I could do a lot myself, get research reports, etc. If I wanted to pick up the phone and call someone to ask, is this infrastructure fund better than this one? What do you think? A Fidelity advisor would answer it and we'd have a conversation. Yep. If I wanted to walk into an uh, an office and meet with someone, I could walk into a Fidelity office. Yeah. So I had that seamless experience and and I got to choose what my level of engagement was. Yeah. Now, 
that was a vertical model in a less, much less regulated environment, so mm. easier to implement. Um, but there's no reason that can't exist here, and and it has to because people aren't going to pay three, four, five thousand dollars for an SOA every time they want to talk to someone. Yeah. So that's also firmly in our sights. Perhaps a little bit further further out. Yep. Um, but yeah, they're the two. They're the two pipe. Um, Big, big picture big ones. Dreams. Yeah, it's um the the whole one to many model is going to need some of these tools because it'll mean you know with some broader coaching behavioural stuff, the the individual can be doing what they need and then can raise their hand. I mean, I think about you know outside of advice, um, a business has done that really well, and and you know there'll be people listening that are about to roll their eyes, but there's a, a website called Adore Beauty, and you can source all sorts of products and just it's just online, right? You're buying online, <laughs> but what they've done that a lot of online services don't do or, or purchasing services is if I want an expert beautician to talk me through choosing this over this, then there's a human being that can chat with me about that. They, they're happy to even to do video chat or they, like, so you can escalate to an es- expert, mm-hmm. get the insight you need. And then off you go back to your, you know, purchasing and doing what you're doing. And I think yeah. there's a lot to learn from that. You know, if we can get clever, then we can let somebody trundle along. Um, and then when they need assistance, then we can get the right person, you know, at the right time on the right platform um, to help. Uh, so, yeah, I love that in a, as an aspiration. I think that's, you know, that's a powerful yeah. vision for us to get to for people. And I don't think it's that far away, to be honest. Again, it's going to take cooperation from a number of different yep. technology providers. It has to be connected to... The full service. Yep. You know, we're hearing a lot in the quality advice review saying that the bank's back into advice, that the <laughs> industry funds are going to get back into advice, and that's fine. That's again that lower touch model. Yeah. But if it is implemented in such a way that as soon as I say I need full service, Host Plus says, "Oh, sorry, we don't we don't deliver that bit. You got to yep. go and see an advisor." Then we'll it'll forever be a broken customer yeah. experience. Yeah. And so. I hope that all of these larger institutions that are looking at it realize that if they're not going to implement the full service themselves, they have to then connect into that uh, that the service um, yeah. uh, to ensure that the best experience is delivered to the customer. Because it is, what's interesting is um, one of the huge barriers to an advisor being able to help quickly, you know, like like leaning quickly is the data. <laughs> like yeah. it's knowing enough that you can go, okay, I can see your whole situation. Oh my, yes, that's a problem, you know, like or whatever it might be. And so if that can be the thing that the client the, can have got oh, them I, further along, themselves further along and, and it's richer quality, then it will mean that you can help faster. Um, you can step third, in, you know. Think of third-party authorities. Oh, you know, wait five days the- to get – <laughs> that shouldn't happen in the no. – that. so, you know, yeah, yeah, there's absolutely. some really practical examples of if that was a problem was solved, my ability to help the clients would be improved and yeah. maybe I wouldn't have to move them off the platform they're currently on right. because I had access to all the information I need to c- deliver a quality ongoing service. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I think there's a lot of – I mean, you know, in fact, robo-advice was the previous black in <laughs> – in, a, um, in advice, but I don't believe it was focused enough on these smaller issues that have a big impact. And I think that what we're talking about here is a whole lot of these friction problems that if we can just solve them, actually the rest of it will sort itself out. Right, so we might um, whereas I think we keep on coming top down a bit too much, action. you know, these big sweeping <laughs> change things. It's like, no, 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 no. There's just some stuff we could make easier <laughs> and yeah, all of a we, sudden it would all be shine, improved. You said shiny objects earlier. Um, yeah. There's... And and part of this is a problem of the, the technology world um, right. coming in and saying, well, we've built this new tool, we need to sell it. Um, yep. It doesn't actually solve one of your core problems, um, yep. but here's, you know, it's shiny. Isn't it so shiny? You should, yeah, you should consider it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, we covered Definitely. a lot. Is there anything oh, we've it. missed? Any core bits that we've... Holiday plans, Peter? Ah, <laughs> well, when this episode is released, I will have come back from seeing the Northern Lights in Alaska. So, oh, that's a, I'm doing right. I'm doing that over New Year's. Yeah, so I'm a little bit excited. It's fair to say. So. Well, well, mine's not quite that glamorous. So I'm just spending a week by a river at Mount Beauty uh, to Ooh, decompress. Nice. Um, and given the amount of snow there was this year, I'm tipping the water will be cold. And apparently. 
jumping into cold water is good for the, the blood pressure and the heart. So maybe I'll come back a you know, looking five years younger. Um, <laughs> exactly. But- we can always hope. We can <laughs> yeah. always hope for sure. <laughs> uh, All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Fin365, then the website website link is in the episode show notes. We've also put in Stephen's LinkedIn details. Feel free to poke him on LinkedIn and I'm sure he'll connect with, you know, with the right person within the team. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. That was really uh actually opened my eyes a bit to what you guys have managed to do and the way you've done it. Um, And I love the combo of an experienced advisor with some tech background. And I think that's probably how you've managed to make the inroads you have. It's sort of a a unique bit of magic. So I can't wait to see what you guys get up to in the future. So thank you so much for your time. No worries. It is a weird mix, um, but it's, it's, (laughs) it's ended me up here. Peter, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Great catching up with you. You're welcome. So, are you a current user of Fin365? Do you, is there anything in particular you love about the tool or you find as a challenge? You know, do you agree or disagree with what we were talking through? I know it was a bit longer, that that episode and, and that interview, but I think it'd be great if you do use the tool or have, please share your insights on the Ensemble Community Platform as this is such a great way to crowdsource how we select these tech tools. Um, any tips you have for other advisors or practices out there would be incredibly valuable and I know would be appreciated. Now, as for my thoughts, like quite honestly, FIN365 has got to be a serious consideration for any practice already operating in the Microsoft productivity suite, right? So if most of the tools you're using in you know, Outlook, Word, Excel, all those sort of things, uh, Teams, um, you know, if you're playing in that space, then what's interesting about selecting a tool like fin 365s five is it's probably going to ensure that you end up getting even more value out of Microsoft, not just out of the advice tool, right? Particularly as it sounds like they're really very well aware of this and so sort of incorporate part of that as the onboarding process to sort of help you get further along in extracting great value out of Microsoft. Um, There's certainly applying energy at all of the, you know, hot topic pain points for advisors and really, you know, bust through some of those bottlenecks we all have struggled with to date. Um, And the fact that they're constantly working on more industry, you know, integrations with industry tools, um, then I could see for those of you that are sort of considering more of a best of breed tech stack approach where you have sort of something in the middle but there's you know you're picking your other best of breed ones to plug in this could be considered that you know the core um, a consideration for the core player you might put um, in that sort of <laughs> diagram for your tech stack. Uh, so definitely worth um, giving them a buzz and checking them out um, and you know the fact that they're well across dealing directly with the providers on on data and, and really trying to bust through making everything work together. You know, that's exciting to me. That's the approach we, we love everybody to have. Now, something that came up during our discussion that I really want to take a moment to do a call out on, and this call out is to the platform providers in the industry. You know, there's so many forces in financial advice that are unknown or that we just can't have any impact on. You know, we don't know what the quality of advice review will result in, how quickly, you know, what impact it might have on our business, on our clients, on how we do things. We don't know what market shocks are going to happen, you know, down the track. I mean, there's so many external factors that are completely outside our control. However, in my view right now, we have the opportunity to fix one thing, one thing that absorbs unnecessary time for the practice, for the platform and for the client. And this one thing is renewal consent forms. We need one form, one agreed form that the client signs with us and can then be submitted to any platform provider. And quite honestly, it's simply not good enough that this is still not the case, given how long consent has now been going on. You know, if you're out there listening to this and you're as (laughs) frustrated by this as I am, and I know lots of others, I get lots of calls about this, then I would love someone within the Ensemble community to start a petition on this point. I'll be the first to sign it. You know, it's something we can fix. We know it, you, you would have one form that the client signs, and this would have an immediate impact on practices. The clients would love it, um, and 
I honestly think we should try and fix these things that we know how to fix them, right? Get them on the list, get them done, tick, move on to the next thing, right? So if you're keen on this, please reach out to me on in either the Ensemble community or on LinkedIn, and I will absolutely spread the word to get as many people signing that petition so we can get this out there and help the platform providers understand that they could actually get some, get a win for us in very short order. So now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity, right? Now, hopefully, we're a few episodes in there, so hopefully you really are building your curiosity habit. But to continue that process, today's Curiosity Corner app that caught my eye is Focusmate. Now, you can find it at focusmate.com. And it's called, basically their tagline is virtual co-working for getting anything done. Now, as someone that runs a virtual financial advice business, this is really interesting to me because when you're working on sort of a project style task, you know, something you might be developing, it might be a program, you might be working on your website, whatever you might be doing, where you know you need to dive in and really a apply a chunk of time and some dedicated brain energy to it, right? That really focused energy. What invariably happens though is as you might start, but you find yourself finding other things to do. You might, you know, generally procrastinate um, and maybe you don't even end up starting it. You just get all sorts of other things on your plate. By making an appointment for a virtual coworker on Focusmate, you're actually committing to someone else because there's somebody on the other side. It could be even on the other side of the world that is also basically you're booking in an agreed time with them. And so it's sort of that little bit of commitment, just like committing to go and play tennis with a mate to get moving or whatever it is. It's a little bit of commitment so that we can, you know, ensure we make progress on the thing we want to get done. Now, what they do is they match you with a member of their community. Um, for whenever you want to focus. Uh, and then at the, the agreed time, you greet your partner, you share what you're trying to knock off, just the headline of the items to knock off, and you both get to work, right? And that could just be quietly working uh, in the agreed time. And at the end of the session, you both check it back in and you celebrate what you got done. Um, now, if you really like the focus partner that you got that you got to, um, you know, set up with, then you can actually make them a fra- favorite and you could build a community of accountability buddies that you can make time with to get stuff done. You know, I mean, th- to me, this is just an amazing concept for this sort of modern working environment. So I encourage you to check it out and, you know, let me know how you find it. Um, but I think it's a really interesting solution in this new virtual world. Welp. That's all we've got for this week. Now, be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you'd like a speaker to help your audience debate the business case for client portals, including a step-by-step process to work out if you need one, how to implement it in the practice, then I can provide either a webinar on the topic or even a full-blown in-person masterclass. We're also actually going to be using client portals as a case study in our niche down and scale up masterclasses this year. After we actually help you work out who you're going to serve, then we're going to work out whether client portals are the way to go. So if any of this is of interest, then please don't hesitate to direct message me on LinkedIn at PeterMD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. (laughs) 